Hello and welcome to another episode of In Focus brought to you by the Uongozi Institute. I'm your host, Guamaka Kifuku. Regional integration, its risks, its challenges, its benefits, and its opportunities is an important subject here in Africa at the moment as we look to integrate both our people and our economies at the regional and the Pan-African level. Here to share what lessons can be drawn from the European integration experience, we're extremely honored to be joined by His Excellency Yirki Katainen, the Prime Minister of the Republic of Finland. Your Excellency, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Now, you're quite well known for a very pro-European stance. Why, why do you believe so much in Europe? Because uh, European countries are so interdependent, and that's why we need integration. Integration, as we have seen, has brought stability and peace to Europe. And also, it has opened up our market to a completely another level than it used to be. So, integration has helped all the member countries to become more prosperous. And, of course, stability is a value itself. And what about the challenges of, of getting that kind of integration? What, what are the, the sort of risks that you see? Where have been areas where integration might not have helped, but where it has been a bit trickier than in other areas, for example? Integration is always uh, quite challenging in a sense that you have to be ready to give up some of your national sovereignty. Even though all the European countries are independent and they are very strong sovereigns, but, uh, but for instance, when... Uh, you are integrating uh, economic policy or, or trade, you must be ready to give up something in order to create a common, uh, common basis. So to learn what we have, uh, the lesson which we have learned during the economic and financial crisis has been that we have to be ready to integrate more our financial, pol financial policy and that is why we have created a banking union. It is about ready to start and this we did not have before the financial crisis but then we realized that we must have a common banking union in order to avoid bank collapses and in order to strengthen um, level playing field uh, with the banks from different countries. Also we learned that we have to pay more attention to competitiveness of single country because um, there were huge differences in competitiveness and if somebody, some country, member country is not competitive enough it can create problems to the others. So um, there are issues in which we need more integration and there are issues in which we need more national responsibility because uh, Integration gives you opportunities, but it gives you also obligations. Yes. But these are all on the economic side of, of the integration. What about, uh, and particularly now that we've seen the expansion of Europe and the restrictions of movement of particularly Romania and, and Bulgaria, I believe. And we saw some sort of within Europe, anti or xenophobic sentiment at, at worst. How, what kind of challenge does that present the European integration project? Everybody who, who wants to join the Euro European Union must be ready. And there are preconditions which the country must meet before coming to, coming to the Union. And uh, of course, there has been some challenges and because the standard of living varies from countries to countries or there are a few countries who are behind the average in Europe, it might cause some, um, some challenges that people start moving from country to country, but this has not been that big problem at the moment. And at the same time, we have to acknowledge that the integration, once the country is in our club or in our, political, in our uh, European family, it helps those countries to become more prosperous also. So, um, one part of the integration is free movement of people. The other two are free movement of goods and free movement of capital. So the whole idea of integration is that we take away border lines between the people, capital and business and try to get try to benefit of more integrated Europe. I mean one of the, one of the tools 
as, as we see it, say, from, from the African perspective of integration has been cultural events, things like the Eurovision, for example. But th the question I have is that you do have member states, say, within that cultural Europe that are different from the political and economic Europe. Yeah. So what is the European identity and how far does it go? Uh, European Union is a union of values. We share the same type of values are like democracy, market economy, um, human rights, uh, freedom of uh, expression and press and stuff. So there are lots of common nominators between the European countries. And the integration process has strengthened this feeling. We have to take care that rule of law strengthens among the member states. But of course there are cultural diversity and this is the richness of our un union. There is a strong Italian culture, strong French, Spanish, Finnish, Swedish culture. But uh, at the same time when there are cultural diversity, there are a common value basis. Mm -hmm. And we have to deepen it because um, the EU is not only a free trade organization or free trade area, it is also a union of values. And, and how does integration um, change Europe's position or relations with the rest of the world? Of course it strengthens the European, uh, European voice because uh, um, for instance at the moment we are negotiating free trade agreement together with the United States of America and it's hard to imagine how this would go on if all the single European member states would do the same. Mm -hmm. So this is one, one of the examples. On the other hand in international politics, European countries are representing the same opinion and it strengthens our position. European Union is the biggest development partner to the rest of the world. So we are a big power in development policy. And, and also what we have seen happening during the financial crisis, Europe has had one voice when negotiating new rules for banking the new rules for central bank policy and so on. So integrated continent gives it an oppo uh, opportunity to, to use one voice, which in our case is a voice of uh, 500 million consumers. But I mean, one of the things that the financial crisis did do is highlight some of the, the disparities, the differences within the European region. Now, is it inevitable that as you have some richer countries and some poorer, for, for lack of a better way of describing them, that some kind of equilibrium will have to be found. So richer countries will have to sacrifice a little bit for the greater good. But how is that, how is that managed really at the, within, at the European level, but then also at the national level? Yeah, this is a big issue at the moment and, and everybody are not satisfied what has happened. The main issue is that, that integration gives you opportunities, but also it gives you obligations. You have to keep your own corners in, in good shape, or you have to keep your own house in order. This has not been the case uh, with all the member countries in, in Europe. And now we have learned a lesson. We have changed our rule base when it comes to fiscal policy or competitiveness and stuff and we are coordinating closer than before, then everybody does what they have promised to do. But nevertheless, there are always situations where some country becomes to the situation which is harder for, for, for her than to the others. And then we have to look whether we should help it or not. We have decided to help the countries who have been under heavy pressure of market. And the reasons why they have ended up to this, to this kind of situation are mostly national. So countries have not, all the countries have not taken care of their national budgets or fiscal policy as well as the others. So we have helped them, we have guaranteed their loan or we have lent money. But uh, at the same time, we have made sure that, uh, that our rule base will change so that it, it encourages everybody to keep their house in order. And finally, just uh, 
on this particular area. What about countries that are sort of within Europe geographically, but then are not part of Europe in the terms of the European Union, countries like Switzerland or Iceland or even Norway? How, what is the relation with those kind of countries? We have um, free trade relationship with them. So the countries which you mentioned have decided not to join the European Union and it's their choice. But they have been willing to create very close connection and ties to the European Union. And then, for instance, uh, our Eastern past partnership, meaning, for instance, Moldova, uh, Georgia, Ukraine, uh, the two countries which I mentioned first, Moldova and Georgia, they are very willing to uh, sign uh, association agreement with, with the European Union. It doesn't mean that they would become immediately as a member of the European Union. I actually, we haven't decided at all whether they will join the European Union, but nevertheless they want to strengthen their ties to the European Union. And uh, Ukraine's situation, unfortunately, at the moment is very, very challenging. There are people who are strongly in favor of European orientation, and, and on the contrary, there are some uh, on the other hand, there are some some political forces who have not been that enthusiastic to integrate to Europe. But, but it's always <coughs> it seems to be so that the, that the countries around Europe or the European Union are willing to uh, come closer to the Union and and try to create at least a trade uh, a closer tra trade ties with the Union. And just to take a completely different view at it, in Africa now we do have the same challenge of integration, albeit yeah. more at the sort of regional levels. And Europe has been a big supporter of integration uh, in Africa. What, what do you see as the kind of lessons that Africa can learn from the challenges and, and, and the processes that Europe is going through? I think there are lots of things to follow what could be differently and what to learn, what we have done right. So I would believe that further integration of African countries would naturally bring more stability and peace to the continent. At the same time, the freer market and single market, it helps uh, companies to go across border, widen their business, sell easily uh, their products and services to the other countries and it will boost the economic growth. It also is healthy in, in a sense that when there is a single market, the companies from different countries have to compete with each other and it usually raises the productivity. So freer trade and single market usually um, uh, helps to get a bigger growth in healthy way, because uh, productivity raises at the same time. Sure. And, and what are some of the things that Africa needs to do to, to get to that point where, you, where you're seeing the benefits? Because it's a huge investment, and yeah. some governments see these as quite risky, given some of the instabilities of their neighbors and so forth. So what are the things that, that African leaders need to put in place or need to, um, how should I say, put across to the public about the benefits of, of integration and the risks as well? Um, I, I see it very, very positively, what has happened here in Eastern Africa. Also, the Horn of Africa has, has been integrating. So, as long as the countries share the same value basis, then the integration is uh, on the health, healthy ground. And, and, and uh, I, I just would encourage African countries, and especially here in Eastern Africa, to go forward and and try to create a single market, and uh, maybe maybe single currency in some perspective. But I, there, there in this part of the integration, there are lots of uh, things what you could learn from Europe if you are uh, willing to create a monetary union. It means that there m must also be a banking union, because monetary union without banking union, 
it's, it's very risky because uh, everybody would like to separate private risks of banks from taxpayers' risks. And that's why there must be a common supervision of the region's banks and also the mechanism how to deal with the failing banks. And also the third point to this, this particular issue, it is necessary to coordinate the differences uh, in competitiveness of the member countries because um, the lack of comp competitiveness of one country can create problems to the other. So, so if, if some area want to create a monetary union, it's a big jump, but it's, uh, it's a good jump if you do the homework properly. Uh, and I mean, one, one of the things we've seen, or at least that has been debated in Africa, is the sense that integration has been over-engineered. There's no kind of buy-in at the, at the ground level for ordinary citizens. And when you look at the European example, a lot of what has now become the EU started off as bilateral agreements that eventually they realized, actually, let's just make one big agreement and move forward. Is that a possible, possible way for Africa to go, or is it now invested in this bigger sort of integration project? Is there, is there a way that they can kind of balance the two? African Union has done a good job, but uh, because the African continent is so large, over 50 countries also, and differences between the countries are very huge, it's very natural that there are regional uh, integration processes going on. It's only positive, I think. Once all the countries on the continent are more or less in the same level, then the regional organization can start putting pieces together. But before this is not ready, uh, it, it is very good that regional organization gets stronger and it is also a good way to practice. And, and the regions can learn from each other also. And, the, and let's, let's imagine, if we will, you, you do have an integrated Africa, and I'll probably ask you how long you think that will take as well, but what would that mean to, to the rest of the world? What would that mean, say, to Europe or to Asia? It is a positive signal, signal to Europe if Africa is more united and, and integrated. Because um, first of all, for instance, to Finnish companies, it's a clear message that, okay, when I come to Tanzania, I have a market of five countries, for instance. It's a, it is just simple as this. And then when the integration usually brings stability and peace, it is also, again, a clear signal that, okay, this region is stable. So there are, there are less risks for, for doing business, for instance. And of course, the regional organization has a bigger say when they are negotiating with uh, either in the, with the private sector or with the uh, public sector. So it's always easier to etaploy to the, to the country which belongs to the like-minded yeah. region, which you know what it is about and uh, that there will be step all surrounding. Sure. And I mean, as I said, how long do you think, in your opinion, would, would that kind of integration take? I mean, not just because of the physical infrastructure that needs to be built, but then the cultural understanding, the dialogue to get or to understand or to synthesize these kind of common values and, and so forth. How, how long and what would that process look like? For me, it's difficult to say how long it will take, but uh, what I have heard here and learned from here is that there is um, integration processes in good speed here. Somebody told me that, uh, for instance, in, from a single market point of view, there are more problems in non-tariff barriers than in tariff barriers. And this also says that it always takes some time to negotiate, uh, negotiate of details of non-tariff barriers. And um, one could also say that integration process is never ready because world around us changes. For instance, um, we used to say that we have a single market in Europe, which is partially true, but uh, because uh, digital content has come to the picture, we, we end up with a situation where we say, okay, we have a single market, but we don't have a single market for, for digital content. And now we are developing it. So because the world around us changed, we have to go further and always tackle new challenges. But um, as I said, 
I cannot say how many years it will take to, to achieve some points, but I, I see clearly that there is a process going on, and I wish all the best. Thank you. Now, to, to balance that, that process, um, I, I have an understanding that in, in Finland you, you have the president and, and the prime minister. And the president is now in charge of, of the foreign relations, yes. but that doesn't include Europe. It's, 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 so how, how, is, how is that balance between sort of national interests and sort of European interests or regional interests and then the so-called foreign interests? Like how does that work in, in, in the context of Finland, for example? Yeah, European Union related issues are seen as domestic issues because um, on the European level we are talking about, for instance, economics, we are talking about industrial policy, we are talking about um, single market for, for everyday goods, we are talking about environmental policy, and they all have impact to our domestic policy. If we, regulate, if we do European regulation for, for um, electricity market, it means that we, we compensate or we change our national legislation so that we take out some of national regulations and compensate it by European regulations. So it is so much domestic related issue what we are doing in, in the European level. But at the same time, there are foreign policy issues which we partially take care of, uh, of in national level, but there are some issues which, we, uh, which, which, which will be raised to the European level. I, I give you just an example. Here I'm, I'm here as a Finnish prime minister to meet Tanzanian president, prime minister, vice president, and, and lots of other ministers. And we have bilateral development projects going on. We have lots of things to, to do in bilateral basis. But just a week ago, the European Union decided that we will participate to Central African Republic's uh, crisis. We will send troops there. So I'm doing here foreign policy bilaterally with Tanzania and the European Union decided that we have to interfere through into the situation in Central Africa. So no single country can answer to the challenges, all the challenges which, which we face. Instead, we need a stronger community to, to do things together when one particular member country is too weak to do. And just uh, since you mentioned it, like what, what does bring you to, to Tanzania? Like why, why are you here this time around? <laughs> yeah, we have a long-standing relationship with, between Finland and Tanzania. It dates back to 1940s. We have done a lot of good uh, development projects here. Um, we are involved in ICT development projects right at the moment here. There are forest projects going on and, and uh, we have lots of political uh, similarities or we have same type of views in some foreign policy issues. So I just wanted to visit here to deepen our political relationship between the two countries. Also, I brought 30 um, people from private sector. There are 30 Finnish companies who are interested in the opportunities, what they see here in, here, here in Tanzania, in forestry, in education, in electricity production, in hub or maintenance and, and logistic uh, related issues, and so on. So, so I'm sure that within next few years our trade relationship with, with, will expand quite remarkably because Tanzania is in good speed to develop and it is also the best way to, to help the country to promote trade because uh, it creates jobs and uh, it, it brings tax revenues. So trade and politics. <laughs> But uh, just, just to, to close that around, so when you're here, you're in the capacity of, of representing Finland. Is there any element or any kind of conflict between representing Finland here and, and representing Europe, as it were? Not really. Because um, there are also some messages which I have delivered uh, to my counterparts which are common from, from European point of view. For instance, 
EU Africa summit we are very interested in about it it should be it's the fourth and it should take place um, in April we have been preparing it and it has not been the easiest summit to, to prepare because there is some different views uh, between EU and, and African Union so we have just wanted to encourage that hopefully we can negotiate all the open questions before the summit and and let's try to have a good summit and good result out of it. And then finally, we'd like to close by saying, you know, is, is there anything you would advise your African counterparts, leaders and so forth, just broadly or on specifically the issue of, of integration? Yeah, I, I think I'm not in a position to ad give advices to anybody, but I just would like to encourage to consider the benefits of, um, of uh, integration because we see them very clearly. And maybe one message would be that integration is, is good, it gives you opportunities, but uh, it also gives you obligations. You have to keep your own house in order. Otherwise, there's a risk that integrated area becomes an area of two big differences and it may lead to the situation in which uh, people don't support the integration because they think that some countries or some citizens must take too big share of the problems of uh, the other countries' citizens or other countries. So you just when you are taking the borders away, which is always good, um, you have to keep your own house in order. Sure. Well, thank you very thank much you for very joining much. us on the program and welcome back to Tanzania. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.